What's the single biggest contribution to business success? That's the question we put to businesses throughout the world. In Japan, the most important key for the success of any company is its people. It's only when the staff can show their best and realize their potential that the company will progress and be successful. Our most valuable asset is our people. In the United States, Gannett and USA Today, the largest circulation newspaper in the United States, are successful because we're well managed. We're well managed because we understand that good profits and good products come from our people. People represent half of our costs and all of our ideas. We believe in training and development for our people. And I'm not talking just about training our managers and supervisors. I'm talking about all of our employees. We understand that if you don't invest in them, then you're wasting a mind and you're wasting significant return on investment. In Germany, it's important that we keep up to date with technology. It's also important for us to have a good worldwide business structure. But the deciding factor is that our workforce is well qualified and motivated. That's what we continue to invest in. And of course, in Great Britain. We are successful because of the people that work for WH Smith. We have millions of customers but only thousands of people that work for our company. And we take an enormous amount of trouble to train and develop those people so that they can give service which marks us out against our competitors. Among world-class companies, there's a global consensus of opinion. That it's the way people are employed, trained and developed that makes the critical difference between success and failure. It's not a new idea. At WH Smith, for instance, they've had a policy of training and development almost since they started more than 200 years ago with just two employees. What's new, however, is that Britain is the first country to recognise organisations which are prepared to invest in people. There's now a special award called Investors in People. A national standard which sets apart businesses, large or small, which get the best out of people by putting the best in. Investors in People has all party support and the backing of the CBI and the TUC. But why do we need it? Investors in People, in my view, is absolutely vital for British business. And British business is vital for the future of every citizen in this country. We are not well competitive enough. And we're not well competitive, frankly, because we don't make the best use of our people. They're not adequately trained, they're not developed, they're not adequately educated. I believe the reality of life is that any decent company in this country is going to have to be an investor in people, if only because they won't attract the brightest and best unless they are. Ultimately, investors in people is good for business. Uh, it makes uh, companies more effective in the way that they uh, manage and develop their workforces and that means uh, more successful businesses in the competitive marketplace. There's nothing magical about it, I say. It's knowing what you're supposed to do within an organisation that knows what it's doing and then being given the training to help you achieve it. And I think that's just good, solid common sense. But there's an awful lot of organisations in Britain who don't organise themselves in that way. If you don't invest in your people, then in the end it affects your profits. And how does it affect your profits? It affects your profits because you get sickness absence, you get premature labor turnover, you get a whole range of stress-related illnesses, and ultimately you get poor productivity, or no productivity at all, or poor quality. So really, you have to look after people. It's absolutely vital. We've done research on probably 20, 25,000 people in a whole range of different jobs. When I go into a workplace, I kind of get a feeling almost immediately that this is a good organization, that there's something right about the people management. And some of the characteristics of the good place are that people are let to get on with the job. They're told what ultimately the objective is, the task, the goal, and let to get on with it. They, they're not bothered. They're allowed to get on with it because basically everybody's been trained up from shop floor to top floor. The atmosphere is right. People are involved. You never hear them talk about the boss, the bad boss. They don't talk about them and us. They talk about us working together as a group, as a team. And that comes, in my view, from the top, from the management style and the training and the people training of the people at the top. It's a genuine investment, a bottom line investment.
This is a bottom line. You'll never convince senior managers about anything unless you can show them that it has bottom line consequences. Investing in people and training people is a bottom line figure, not an irrelevance. All kinds of organizations, large and small across all sectors and in all parts of the country, are becoming investors in people. We sent our reporter to find out why. Do you remember the bad old days of British Leyland, when it looked as though car manufacturing in this country was doomed to end in turmoil, with millions of man days lost in strikes and millions of pounds lost through poor productivity. The view at that time was that British Leyland's chances of survival were five to one against. So who could have predicted that out of so much conflict could evolve a success story? Well, above all, Rover could. Somehow it managed to climb out of the mire of discontent and transform itself into a world-class company with a product and a workforce so attractive that it was bought by one of its biggest rivals, BMW. But their intention was not to dismantle the company or to move it, but just to keep it the way it was. Rover, of course, is a famous mark in the best of British tradition. The first Rover was built in 1904 at a cost of 100 guineas. Today's Rovers cost from £5,500 for the Mini to over £40,000 for the top range Rover. They're sold in 150 countries and achieve a sales revenue of £4.3 billion a year. So how then did Rover achieve the impossible and turn this into this? For the answer to that, you've got to go back to the mid-80s. Uh, up to that time, the history of industrial relations in our company and others was not ever so good. We decided what we needed to, to do was to understand what our own people really thought about us and about the company. So we carried out an attitude survey. And frankly, we weren't really prepared for the response that we got. What our people told us was that they were interested in the business, that they did care about the business. They wanted to be involved in solving the problems of the business. So a lot of old stereotypes were knocked apart. I think going back to the mid-80s, few people uh, would have thought that there was that power and potential within the organisation. And really it was from that point onwards that we recognised the potential and the value for investing in our people. So what did you have to do to become an investor in people? Our programme has been to give everybody, every single person in the company, those skills that are necessary. Problem solving skills, communication skills, team working skills. When people are part of the same team then they feel obliged to everybody else in the team to make a contribution. We've got rid of a lot of unnecessary differences in work wear. Um, we all dress the same in Rover nowadays. There's no managers in pinstripe suits lording it around the place. Um, it's just our names. There's no titles. Uh, and we, we're trying to ensure that we've got an environment where everybody feels as though they're part of the same team. In the last attitude survey we carried out, 95% of the people in Rover said they were proud to work for Rover. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Rover Group consists of five distinct business units and it was decided that each one would apply separately for the Investors in People standard. In fact, Investors in People worked so well for the purchasing department that they're now keen for all suppliers to Rover Group to achieve the standard too. We already insist that our suppliers achieve BS5750, the nationally accredited standard of quality management. We're now moving on to encourage those same suppliers to achieve the Investors in People standard. And the reason that we are doing that is that if you consider that 75% of the costs of Rover Group, some £3 billion, are spent outside our organisation, then if we're to achieve a world-class standard, then they have to do likewise. It's not good enough for our suppliers to pay lip service to being an investor in people. Now, from my training budget of £350,000, we've generated sufficient savings to fund a whole new Rover model. In other words, from a few thousand pounds by investing in people, we've achieved millions. Now it's no wonder that we'd like our suppliers to achieve a similar result and achieve a similar benefit. But what about the workforce? Many people working at Rover today can remember a time at British Leyland when it was the done thing to be anti-management, anti-company. Has that really changed? 
Well, perhaps one recent story illustrates that change most of all. It was Christmas time and the works were closed down. The phone rang in the security office. It was a United Nations driver under shell fire in war-torn Bosnia. He needed urgent technical assistance for his Land Rover Defender. In the old days, the response might have been... I'm sorry, mate, there's nobody here over the holidays. You'll have to call back in the new year. But that wasn't what happened. I didn't want to let down the United Nations. I didn't want to let down Rover Group. After all, they do encourage initiative. That's what investing in people is all about. After checking through technical information, manuals, I rang him back and he did get back on the road. Maybe a few years ago, the security guard might have said, more than my job's worth. Since Rover has invested in its people, it's made jobs more interesting, exciting. And you never know what will happen next. Most businesses survive the recession by reducing their prices. But not this hair and beauty salon, David Frank of Lancaster. They've succeeded by doing the exact opposite. Up have gone their prices and up has gone their market. And it's a strategy that's worked because up too are turnover, profits and customer satisfaction. In the past, only ordinary hair colouring was offered. Now you can have organic hair colouring without chemicals and costing 30% more. In the past, you could have an ordinary beauty massage. Now you can have a body massage using the exclusive Clarins Paris method, costing 25% more. But whilst the treatments have become more exotic and the salon surroundings have been made more exclusive, the staff have remained the same. So how has the owner, David Atkinson, made his brave strategy work? Well, certainly the investment in the look of the salon was most important, but by far the most important was the investment in my staff and enable them to offer a far higher service to our clients. That really was the key to the strategy. So what made you decide to go up market? It was the most important business decision of my life. I was on holiday at the time. I decided that it was far better to go up the market rather than down the market. After all, there are an awful lot of people out there who are prepared to pay more money for a better service. I came home to Lancaster, I gave my ideas, my vision to the staff, they were excited, they were keen, and they've stayed with me. In December 1993, David Frank of Lancaster was awarded Investors in People status, and his customers aren't surprised that the business has achieved this award. I've been coming to David Franks now for eight years and since they've got the Investors in People Award I think the biggest difference that I've noticed is that the staff really function and make you feel welcome and that they really belong here. They don't just work here, they really are part of the business and I just think that's great. And to what do the staff attribute such glowing comments? Well Investors in People really turned things around for me. I was a stylist. I've been here six years and I was starting to get a little bit bored, but we became an investor in people and I talked to David through staff appraisals, I said I would like more responsibility, he sent me away, I've done a lot more training and since that I've been promoted to manager and it's been really, really great. At David Frank of Lancaster, Investors in People has been given the beauty treatment and the results are more than skin deep. For the teams of people who are invested in, who are trained and developed, and who share the same vision, the world knows no bounds. Lift off. We have a lift off. Well, the investment in people has always benefited NASA. NASA is an agency that is pushing the edges of technology. We pushed the edges of technology in the early space program when we went to the moon. There you go. And now with our shuttle program. None of this could have been done without the right people. People who are talented, people who are dedicated, people who can make it happen with the right kind of training to do the job. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All right, let's go. 